Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about my favorite library in recent times that it's it's pretty popular in the Angular world, but it's relevant for pretty much anyone working in the front end, whether you're in React or Vue or God knows what else comes out in the next week or two. Uh, but it is one of the most powerful tools I would say I've worked with in quite some time. I'll give you a real world example of how I was able to lower... Uh, API calls using some of the items that are associated with it as it takes a very functional approach and it's um, sometimes feels a little bit like black magic but it's just because a lot of the concepts in it are kind of new so let's go ahead and dive into it <laughs> I want to take a moment to thank our long-term sponsor, Dev Mountain Coding Bootcamp. Dev Mountain has various programs from iOS development to UI UX, full stack web development, and quality assurance. I actually had the pleasure of visiting one of their campuses about two years ago in Provo when they still had a location there. And it was a fantastic experience just to be able to meet everybody, see the campus, and it one thing that's unique about them is they actually include housing with their tuition. So if you're interested, check the link in the description below. All right. So if you haven't heard of RxJS, I, uh, this is so funny. You use things sometimes that are acronyms and you don't even know what the acronym stands for. So I actually looked it up for this video just cause it's, I had no idea, but it stands for the reactive extensions for JavaScript. Now, what does that mean? Well, quite a, uh, quite a bit. So, um, RxJS, um, uh, one of the hottest libraries. <laughs> it's like, yo, calm down in your own Kool-Aid over there. Uh, but uh, no, um, RxJS is one of these libraries that gives you a lot of cool functionality that you you don't necessarily, that's very difficult to add on your own. Um, it adds concepts that you may not be familiar with, such as um, behavior subjects and it like let me give you an example of behavior subject so the behavior subject you can see here is a value that essentially what you do is you're creating a value with a behavior subject that you subscribe to elsewhere and whenever it's you're you're creating this one location with the behavior subject and anywhere else it's almost like an event listener so i would explain it and you have the ability to trigger when something then gets emitted with this next and then anywhere you have that subscription, you can then go and fire off an update and so on and so forth. And, and you know, each one of these subscribes might do something different with that data. But then you can, you know, you can go even further where you can do things like um, from event, which allows us to store whenever a document is clicked. And then you can concatenate values with it, right? Where in this pipe, pipe is one of these methods that allows you to concatenate methods together. It's a method to do additional methods. And then you can essentially map that value where on any document click, go ahead and return this object that's mapped like so, and then go ahead and, and send it to the next one, merge it. So there's the, the main issue with RxJS a lot of times is not the concept so much, but they're like on RxJS version six now, and so the 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 best practices with RxJS, um, once you sort of get the hang of it, is that they seem to change as frequently as every six months they make a breaking version. I'm not quite sure why. Um, it happens quite quite frequently, but one of the reasons it's so powerful that may not be apparent is there's certain things that we can do utilizing the library where you have the ability to update. So like typically in your front end applications or your front end spas, you would take a very um, parent to child relationship. And that works some of the time, right? Uh, a good portion of the time where we have parent, parent hands data to child, child hands data to its child, and then you can cascade it downward when that works. But sometimes there's, there's just not a way to make that work cleanly or properly without just corrupting your whole application. And you might have an event that happens in the child, but two separate things in the parent care uh, that there's no way to get that data to. You can do that subscription, which would then update. And you can 
take this functional approach where we're not necessarily um, modifying things and, and do a much better way of going about it. Now, uh, you'll you'll have to if it's something you're interested in review all of these items and how they're different. Uh, async subject, for instance, something uh, that each one of these subjects are slightly different, and we could be here for like there's like eight or nine hour courses just going through the documentation here. By and large, you're gonna use a few things of here, and in the latest course that I'm working on, I actually use RxJS quite a bit where you could th see things where I am creating subscriptions for like debouncing. So remember earlier when I said, oh, hey, that pipe operator allows us to, would we click something and then would fire off like an API call? How many times have we had to fire off an API call, but user, we're worried users are spamming it, they're double clicking it, they're triple clicking it. Well, RxJS, one of the things that you can do once you start getting good with it is you can start learning some of these operators of how it makes, you know, how it makes your life a little bit easier. So you could use things like uh, debounce or debounce time, I think it is, where you all you do in your pipe is you throw this debounce time, which it's not going to fire off in, until, you know, half a second in this case, whatever you want it to be, where you can click as much as you want. It's not doing anything before it emits. Where before it says, "Hey, we our event happened. We clicked it. A user entered. Whatever it is that says, hey, where where our subscription is, we want to let the people who care that something happened. We're waiting until they stop doing this foolishness, right? So you can start doing very nice things or concatenate it with like distinct until change. What that does is it's not going to emit if the value is the same as the last one." And then, you know, you have some of these that you can sort of figure out, right? Filter, so on and so forth, where it's not going to put values uh, through that don't meet your criteria, right? And so it's only going to, like, let's say you had an array that you're keeping track of. And for some reason, it got set to a falsy value. You could have a filter that said, hey, if it's a falsy value, don't send it up and mess up the rest of my app. You can't necessarily do that. Um you know, it, without a lot of very complicated logic. And I'm not saying to go and just utilize some of this stuff, but there's very valid use cases as I'll, I'm going to hop on a whiteboard here in just a second and sort of explain. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some practical examples of how we might use a, a singleton service and a pub sub model. So I always think for you to understand a good design principle, you have to understand where they're coming from and what's the problem they're trying to solve. And I think a good way of learning that is by getting a very practical example. So here we have a web page. Up here is the, the top toolbar navigation. And we're working on an e-commerce platform, for instance. And you might say, okay, cool. Uh, a lot of us have worked on e-commerce platforms. And the business has in the top you know, top left corner, maybe have a logo here, we have their heading here, like their business name, and in the far right corner, we have a bag, right? We're adding items to our bag, a cart like Amazon. And in our bag, we have a bag, and then right above the bag, we have a number associated with how many items are in the cart. Cool. All right. So, <laughs> um, you know, I've seen this solved numerous ways. And what they want is, regardless if we're on the home page uh, or we're on a shopping page, when I click, say we're on a shopping page, and so I have my, you know, I have my image here, I have my description here, and then I have this button that says add. I want this to fire off an API call. I then want this to now say I have six items in my bag. And there's a couple ways that we can go about that that doesn't actually require an additional API call, where every single time this is firing off. Now, you could do that. That's fine. But one thing that you can do is, you know, you don't necessarily... So a couple ways people have done this in the past is they've stored this globally or they've done multiple API calls where when we when this API, add, is called, they then call the cart API manually to fire off an update. So in a, in a pub sub model, where what would happen here is essentially this, is we could actually put an event listener, if you want to think of it that way, it's not really an event listener, but it's very similar where we say, when this event occurs, update this. And so you have this 
you have this product where whenever a pro an event here happens that we care about where this cart item is directly correlated to let's say the um, the items service and so we are essentially subscribing here we subscribe on load to the item service so we subscribe to item service and then from that point what happens is we whenever this is published it we know that in our subscription we do something so when this publishes when our event publishes when our event occurs where we're subscribed we go and do something that's all it is and so really in in a, in a very simplified form it's a it's a um it's a event listener that we do something with um so that's a that's one basic example another example that i've seen quite frequently is say um you know forget the cart for a second say we're building a crud application right of some sort or we're just doing any sort of asynchronous calls and we have we have a drop down we have this drop down that's on every single page different spots not in the same so we can't really use uh, proper routing all this sort of stuff and in here we have five values that pretty much never change or when they do we don't really care that it gets refreshed on a user refresh and so what may happen is if you have 10 nested navigation it's a little bit but let's just say you have a couple that this fires off an api call for the same data this fires off an api call for the same data this fires off an api call for the same data this fires off an api call for the same data and you know there's a lot of wonky ways that people try to avoid that the pub sub model is is pretty good in that fashion where essentially what we would do is on app load we would create our we do our initialization so we would essentially have something for them to subscribe to we then at that point would say okay cool wherever this is being used whenever we initialize we have subscriptions set up at all these points we have five subscriptions for this one thing right and when this gets initialized and gets the values we want to send it to these five locations so they always have it and so these values are always existing and when we have that or when the, when we have these values they'll get the latest and we'll only do one api call the whole time unless we force an api call down the road and that way we can stop uh, multiple api calls and to give you an idea of how powerful something like this could be I was doing some metrics at my work where I was uh, do, fixing it, and we took we took a uh, I took a part of the project where we were doing three calls on load down to one, so we went from three to one, and then we took five calls on load for another one, brought it down to one, and of those five three of them were called in six function calls so you say okay well we lost two here we lost four here and then this just became obsolete so if you say okay cool um let's say for you do the whole app portion of the main part that does this six times that's 18 so we were able to get two api calls for these and create essentially uh, three or four subscriptions that eliminated was that 24 api calls in a full app usage so it's a very powerful item and it's a pretty simple um, design pattern that uh, we'll show you an example of using uh, rxjs and behavior subjects and subjects uh, right now all right guys well i hope you found that helpful we can't really cover rxjs in a 10 minute video i do plan on doing some tutorials with it later on and uh, it's definitely a big part of my latest uh, course that I'm working on, the 100 Angular Challenge, um, which shouldn't even really talk about in this because it's still got a little bit of ways to go. But um, it is a library that I do think that if you, you want to take some time to dive into it, to watch an hour tutorial with, and really start seeing the benefits of it, it is something I think you're going to see more and more. And the concept of... Um, subjects and observables has been something 
uh, submitted in the past to the ECMAScript Foundation, and like I think they just scrapped it, and they're going to do it again. And so this is uh, one of the things that they may not be implemented like this, but it is some, one of the concepts that will probably come up in web development one form or fashion down the road. And, uh, you know, for me, when I first started playing with it, I didn't really like it because it seemed like it broke every month. And then I didn't really like it because um, I didn't quite understand the... There's one, one issue with using a library like this is that there's a lot of terminology that you don't quite yet pick up on. And you have to learn... I, I'm not a big fan of learning libraries in general because I, I think a lot of... They become cr uh, sort of crutches for people. But this one has really won me over and has made my development so much more verbose in the sense of the functionality that I'm able to deliver in a, a timely fashion as well as just an impressive fashion and there's there's a lot of stuff that we were able to accomplish such as the API call example and um, you know there's other ways that we can do that in in, in the front end but um, to me, it was a safer way of using behavior subjects, for instance. So with that all being said, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I appreciate it. If you're interested in my current courses, there's links in the description below. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hey, guys, don't forget to hit that notification bell or smash that like button while you're at it. And if you're interested, I just released my latest course, the 100 Front End Technical Question Challenge, which is there to help you pass those front end technical interviews. There's over 100 questions. You can get it for just $9.99. The link is in the description below or use coupon code CODINGGOD.